Hey guys, Space Marine 608 here, doing a bit of a post-editing intro here. Uh, I'm doing a little differently today because I wanted to point out uh, something I don't make necessarily that clear in the video, is that by doing this method, by creating event-driven UI as well as using soft references, um, we're going to be saving about 16 times the amount of memory um, between the two different types of player pawns. So I have one that is using um, sort of the direct reference way versus one using the correct way, in my opinion, which is soft object references um, and listeners and event dispatchers. Um, so we're saving almost 16 times the amount of memory. It turns from 405 loaded memory size down to 25, technically 24 after um, we actually remove the last one that I use as an example. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty wild. Get ready, buckle in. Um, so this is sort of a generalized video for the two topics, but also sort of how they work together. Uh, the reason why I wanted to do it in one video is because they actually work pretty well together to kind of um, help sort of reduce each other in their own way um, to easier to understand topics. So let's actually talk first about um, how we get here. How do we figure out what needs to be um, a soft object reference, and then we'll talk about how you can use your UI using event-driven um, UI to actually make it work with soft object references versus like, you know, normally in UI um, in UMG, you know, people like to bind to variables or they like to, to, you know, call certain events on things to make things happen within their UI, but there's ways we can make it a little bit easier on ourselves, especially if we're going to have it be uh, its own sort of entity. So let's go ahead and take a look here. The first thing I want to kind of discuss is actually how you figure out what you're going to be doing this on. So taking a look here, we have our um, sort of new player pawn. This has all or almost all of the same things as the regular player pawn. Um, this is using entirely um, components and interfaces and soft object references for almost everything. Now I've specifically removed the soft object reference for the new player HUD, just so I can kind of show you what this looks like. Um, so for example, here I've got this new player HUD. Now I don't need to reference this because I don't need to send any direct information to it. Um, and so to sort of pull this out of here, you know, when I'm spawning it, you know, maybe I don't need it to be actually be hard referenced here. Instead, I can actually apply this um, once I've once I've actually um, made my new player UI. I can do this with a soft object reference instead of a hard reference. But let's actually take a look at the difference here between the current existing player pawn, so this new player pawn, and the old one. So you can see here it's about 25 megabits in memory size, uh, and this guy is about 51 megabytes. So, you know, relatively small. I'd say combined, you know, if you want to look at combined, that's it's not an exact metric because there's, there's a lot of different things that go into these, but about 75 megabytes total between the disk and the memory size. Now let's take a look at the old player pawn. Um, for just the disc size, it's 157. So it's already larger on just the disc alone. In fact, it's about three times as large on the disc versus the new version. And then if we go ahead and look at the memory size, it's half of a gig almost. Um, this is just looking at the game dependencies. If you look at all dependencies, it's even more, but just looking at the game dependencies, like it is massive. 450 megabytes is huge. As you guys think about when you load this in, you're loading in a half a gig of information from this one class alone, not counting anything else, you know, that it loads and, and all the information and everything. Because like, for example, here it loads base ship AI, which is another 119 megs. This is the combined total, but that's basically what you're looking at. Each of these are things that's loading in these massive, huge things. So how can we kind of cut that down? Um, well, the first thing you can do and the hardest thing you can do is going to be event driven event driven UI. Um, the reason why you want to start with this instead of the soft object references is because once you get everything pulled out of your actual player pawn and are no longer directly referencing your player pawn, uh, it's a lot easier to use soft references. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that actually means. What does event driven UI mean? Well, here in my actual um, I have a couple widgets. So I've got a docking widget three different attribute widgets. And then over here, you can't really see it, but it's there. There's a status effect widget. This only really shows up if you have a status effect active. 
Within these, I have a couple of items here. I have an attribute, I have a bar color, and then a warning tag. These two tags here, the attribute tag and the warning tag, these are the most important pieces to this. These are actually what the specific attribute progress bar lists to. So if we actually look at my UI, the only thing I have here is an interface call. That is it. There is nothing else in here, nothing referencing this. That's that's literally it. So if we go into my attributes progress bar, this is a generic widget I created that basically what it does is it's got a couple of items here. It's got a progress bar, it's got some text, and then it's got a warning icon. In here, um, in my actual event graph, when I start up the game, I basically just set the fill color and opacity. I go through a branch just checking that the warning tag exists because if it doesn't exist, I can basically ignore setting up a listener. Uh, for example, for my superstructure, my player superstructure, it's not currently a warning, so I don't need to set up a listener if there's no warning that exists. But if it does exist, we just cast to the owning player pawn, um, and, or sorry, not cast, let me use the correct terminology here. We're not casting because we're not getting the exact class. This is just a generic pawn object. So we're just calling out uh, to the owner, hey, what is my owner's playing pawn? We then get the component on there by class. So here I'm just getting a um, reference to gameplay tags, which even this probably could be a soft object reference, but this is a very small thing. Don't need to worry about that right now. Um, but we're just calling out for this gameplay tags component, which is on my player. And then we're just saying uh, to this function on that component, add a tag listener. And so we send in the warning tag and we add the tag listener. And what this means is anytime the warning tag gets added or removed, um, it calls an event through event dispatcher um, that then just toggles that warning either on or off. So what does that actually look like? What does a listener look like? Um, well, if we actually open this up, within my component, the gameplay tags component, I have here a function that takes in a tag to listen to and an event. So this event delegate. The only way to get an event delegate is to drag it off of an event dispatcher. So what you have to do is you have to create an event dispatcher over here and then you drag it from the event over here. That's the only way to get a delegate because that's the only way to access delegates is through these. Um, but what I've done here is there used to be, you have to used to hard code it. Nowadays they have a switch on gameplay tag, uh, but essentially you just come in here and I've got a switch on gameplay tag and I output it to these different stacks. You know, here's my um, different possible tags I could be, you know, calling the event for, be a tag listener. And it comes over here and it says a bind event to reactor critical. So what this does is it says um, reactor critical. If that tag comes in, it's going to call all of these events. So this is saying when I'm in my UI, right? What I'm doing is I'm or sorry, but I'm specifically in my attribute progress bar. When I'm calling this, I'm saying, hey, if you get a warning tag, either added or removed, I don't care give me an event here that is called. And then what my event listener here is doing is it's saying, hey, here's the context of that event, which is something I created that's a structure. And I'm passing that in through a signature, which I'll show you here in a moment. And it's just calling a simple function here on my UI saying toggle warning. So this takes that context. So this is a struct I created that's got a context tag. So this is what tag actually was doing the thing. So if we just break this, uh, or actually is it set? Yeah. Um, so you can, you can basically go in and set that tag. So if you want to, which you shouldn't need to, but this is basically the tag that's doing the changing. So if you wanted to have multiple tags that could affect this, but do different things based on the tag that affected it, you could do so. Uh, for example, if you want to have a warning, but you want to have a light warning versus a dark warning, you could then, when either warning triggers, check which warning was the one that triggered, and then do one or the other things. Um, but then I also have the active tags of the current context. So this is for my gameplay tags um, component. What are the active tags? And then the origin of who started this. And then from here, um, I'm just comparing it to the warning tag. So I go, hey, to the current, now that we've triggered this event, a warning tag has either been added or removed. We just go, hey, for the active tags, do we have a warning? Yes. 
then we're going to show the warning and play the animation if it's not already playing. If no, so we don't have a tag, so it's probably been removed, we're going to mark the warning icon as hidden and stop the animation if it's currently playing. Um, and so this is just a very simple way to turn on and off with just a simple tag. And that tag gets added through events within the player components. So for example, as my ship heats up, um, as the, the, the attribute gains heat, um, it'll hit a point in which it will add the tag saying, oh, you've gone over the heat limit. Here's a tag saying you're starting to get overheated. When that trigger fires, that thing calls out to this. So let's actually look at the notify tag change. So this is the actual notify where that call actually happens. So the previous one was how to bind that event, bind that action happening when that call is made. Here's the actual call being made. So the tag is just showing what tag is needing to be notified. So you're saying, hey, here's a tag has been added. Here's the tag. Um, and so it's going, oh, you know, the warning tag was added, let's say as an example. And so we go, oh no, they're overheating. So we're gonna go overheating and we come over here and we call the overheating. This is an event dispatcher. So this says everything that's listening about the player being overheating, by the way, the player is now overheating, um, or they could be stopping overheating. So this does both. So it could be the player's now overheating or the player's no longer overheating, depending on what the actual, as you can see here, what the actual active tag is. And so um, we pass in our gameplay context here as that struct, and that's getting handed out to all the things that are listening for that. So now my HUD now knows, so through the attribute progress bar, the HUD now goes, oh, hey, I heard that the player is now overheating. I'm gonna now show that player is overheating. So this only ever fires when that actual call is made out. And I do this almost the exact same thing uh, for an attribute listener for actual attributes changing. Um, so basically attributes work identically um, to gameplay tags with the exception of they store a little bit more information about like actual details. So you see here, you got attribute listener, just like gameplay tag listener. Um, and you have, let's go here. Now see, I currently don't have a notify attribute because I could add a, um, Actually, no, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so as you can see here, we have an attribute listener. So what happens is we bind the events here so that anytime these attributes change, we actually call one of these. So, oh, that's right, because we call it something different. So if we go here for change attribute, because we're doing a couple things here, um, it's slightly different name. So whenever we change this attribute, we call that event delegate. And so I change the attribute value, I pass in the struct of the attribute, change the value that I'm changing. Uh, and then I also create that context like I did in the other one. And then I just call it here. So this all it's doing is going in the struct, it's setting the members in that struct. And then it's saying, hey, by the way, to anyone listening, including the HUD, which is listening because of this event, it goes, hey, if you're listening, uh, by the way, something has changed. So then I come in here and I go, okay, Let's get the attribute change. Let's calculate its value. Let's break the struct. We're going to divide that calculated value by the max and then set that to the percent of that progress bar. This only gets called though when that event actually gets called. So anytime that attribute changes, whether it increases or decreases, we just call out and say, hey, what does that now look like? As you can see here, uh, this was all done on begin play uh, on construct technically for UI. Um, and so I also set up just after it, the attribute tag information, um, the attribute name um, from that tag, and then any kind of other values I wanted to set up. So this is all just to kind of set up um, this actual progress bar. Because what I do on here is I, I set up the name, I set up the actual, you know, color, I set up all the, all the different steps to that progress bar. Um, but yeah, so. It's a bit of a long-winded explanation, but that is event-driven UI. That is how you can take things happening in a component and have it just listened to by the UI instead of there being a hard reference. And so things in the UI only ever change when that call is actually made. So how do you spawn that on the player without having a direct hard reference? 
Well, if we're looking here, this is what you would normally do, right? So let's actually just remove this out of the way. So what you normally do is you just get the player controller, pass it as the only player, and create new player HUD widget. And then you probably pull off of here and call some event. Anytime you want something to change, or you know, maybe you have the, the HUD ticking or something like that, and you'd be pulling information from the player. That's a very inefficient way to do it. And so what we're actually doing here is, as you can see here, this class, even though this is one set within this function, this is still hard reference because the function understands um, that it that it is taking in this information. You're giving it the actual class here. Well, how do we actually remove that? Well, what you can do is what I did here is I just pulled off from here and promoted to a variable. And by default, that's going to be just a regular old user widget class. Uh, but if you click on here and it'll start as a class reference, see it's a reference there to that class, we change it to a soft class reference. And what that means is that that gives you the path to that class. So it's the, the where that class exists, but it doesn't know anything about the class. Rather than being an actual reference to the class, it's just a reference to the path of the class. That's the way you can think of soft object references and soft class references. Um, but if we go ahead and save it, now we're actually just passing in that soft reference. So what's happening is, as this gets added, it converts the soft reference into an actual reference of this class. It goes, oh, so here's the address. Let's go to that address, grab that soft reference. If it isn't already loaded into memory, it's going to return none. But if it gets loaded into memory, it's then going to actually load it here. And so if we come back to our player class here, boom. Now we have it loaded in. So our UI is here. It's functioning. That's our event driven UI. As you can see there, we've got a status effect due to taking damage and our health has decreased. And so if we actually go into our size map now, uh, as you may remember before, we had that reference to the HUD because we were spawning in the HUD. That's now gone. It's completely removed. So now, as you can see, all we have a reference to is some actual static meshes on our um, player pod. So it's only a megabyte in this situation. Of course, if you have a really advanced UI or a lot of things going on or really big textures, whatever you change into a soft object reference, you're of course gonna remove it by you know a larger amount. It just depends on what you're actually soft referencing. But yeah. It's as simple as that. It's a very simple way to just use soft object references. There's still a little bit um, more to these that you'll want to know for things like, you know, you can asynchronously load these class assets. Um, so one thing that is actually pretty handy to do uh, is if, if this is not loaded by the time you get to this step, you're going to want to make sure it's loaded. So what you can actually do is just do this. And what this means is that um, See, in this example, it's, it's uh, trying to load the object class reference, uh, which is not compatible with the um, user widget one. Uh, but you, you would, if you had like the correct asynchronous load, you could load it and make sure that things don't carry on until it's loaded. Or at the very least, this happens sort of asynchronously in the background. Uh, but there's a whole lot to soft object references. Uh, they're a very complicated topic. Uh, but this is a very easy you know sort of primer to them is sort of understanding that now that you know we've got a reference to the address of this class we can then get the class by pulling it in um, but yeah i believe that is pretty much everything if you have any questions definitely leave them down below but otherwise good luck and good hunting